Okay, this is the uh, final lecture for the review section, except for uh, chapter 10, which is a complex variable chapter. Um, we'll do that next week, but today uh, I'd really like to make that connection more solid between uh, the quantum mechanics and the classical mechanics. And the key um, person and that is a, a rascal named Jacoby, who worked with Hamilton. And uh, Hamilton-Jacoby equations are the uh, classical version of quantum mechanics, really. And we'll talk about that toward the end of this lecture, about the basic idea of the Hamilton-Jacoby equations to handle uh, systems of, of uh, trajectories, such as the one we've already uh, given to you as a homework, the, ex the uh, volcano and the um, atomic clock. Uh, really amazing uh, piece of engineering for cesium uh, atoms to, to just to interrogate the very top of the, of the envelope uh, where there's no Doppler shift and therefore give you a very precise time which that goes uh, to the uh, National Institutes of Standards and Technology. So that will be uh, one of the things that I would like to make a big deal about. And the, uh, uh, this character here, uh, I really am impressed by the hairdo. Uh, how long did it take to grow that much hair? <laughs> Or did you just buy it as a wig? I don't. I don't know. It was quite uh, fashionable. And uh, this is the uh, late 1600s. We uh, worked on what we're going to talk about today, and that is uh, one of the improvements to a pendulum clock that I like to say it saved physics because pendulum clocks, as we uh, looked at very briefly in the last lecture, are. are um, not all they're cracked up to be, and they very quickly get out of sync. So, um, one of uh, his creations is recreated on the wall, and we'll look at the simulations of that uh, here. Got a color, another thing I'd uh, like to show you, and this is the use of phase space to um, sort of control something. It's just a, it's just a brief vignette here called Catcher in the Eye. Does anybody uh, know what that's referring to in the literature? J.D. Salinger. Catcher in the Rye. Catcher in the Rye. Uh, we'll, we'll see what that means in mechanics. Um, I my apologies to J.D. <laughs> anyway, um, the whole idea of phase space and uh, action and all of the things that are really now called semi-classical mechanics uh, are uh, the topic of this of this lecture. Now, um, I think what I probably ought to do is we talked already about uh, this particular uh, occurrence, uh, this uh, thing enough, and also in this lecture is a sketch of what I had in mind uh, for your problem that you uh, did or have, I hope, done already. Um, just for a brief uh, moment here, and this is on the last uh, uh, screen, uh, I'd like to show you uh, the oscillator. Um, let me get this thing on the uh, lecture again and get it playing. Uh, the oscillator uh, in, uh, animation um, and <clears throat> this just. I haven't tried this link actually on this particular machine. Let's just see um, if it uh, uh, works. And I need to go ahead here to where I really need that. Yeah, this is a good one. If this works, it's quite, quite beautiful. So it starts out like the uh, volcanoes of EO, except we're in a, inside the Earth now, and it's, it's an exploding neut neutron star in our fictional uh, representation. And 
what I'm doing with the color is very important, and that's going to be the last topic of this uh, lecture today. What we do is we color the uh, trajectories according to the value of the Lagrangian, and since that uh, is related to the quantum phase, what you get is a color outline of a quantum wave function. This is a really sneaky way to solve quantum mechanical problems that was discovered by uh, Rick Heller. Um, and uh, I had a hand in that too, and the coloring of a trajectory was not what they were really emphasizing. What they were emphasizing was dragging a little Gaussian uh, wave packet on each trajectory. The computer can do that uh, easily and phasing it according to the Lagrangian and just summing all of those up to make a wave function. And then you autocorrelate that and you get the spectrum. So uh, I, you, you people should keep this in mind because there probably are quantum mechanical problems that are really hard to solve by ordinary matrix methods. This uh, is an alternative that is very powerful. And uh, it happens that this one goes on giving the phases. Uh, if I resume this particular animation, uh, it will just keep doing it. But that, that's, uh, I think, a, a really cool example of uh, a family of trajectories, very organized one, and this is a high symmetry system, so we get to do this very easily. It's done in one pass, essentially. But then it just keeps on going. This is what the mechanical um, effect would be if you had an explosion. Assuming that these uh, objects, when they uh, come together again, can go through each other. And of course, you assume that when you're doing the classical uh, trajectory analysis. Uh, so that would then give a wave function for a harmonic oscillator. And you can check that very nicely against uh, in this case, you can do that analytically. So, um, I'll pause that. Um, the picture here is another uh, example uh, of that. And these, this particular slide, uh, and the one that's at the end there, um, shows the controls that you uh, mess with. And the controls are right out in front. If you go uh, click that, uh, you get the controls to come up in that form. This is an older uh, version of this particular program. Okay, um, we've got a bit of work to do, uh, though. I would like to make sure that we uh, understand the just a single dimensional harmonic oscillator. Uh, and so I want to go over again uh, this particular um, vignette of algebra and geometry. And um, so I will get this on all three screens so that uh, we can uh, uh, take a look at that. Uh, this particular one right here I think is ready to move as well. So I will do that. And that's what we're after is the Hamiltonian plotted in terms of its coordinate and its momentum. It's two-dimensional in that sense. It's a one-dimensional oscillator, a one-dimensional pendulum. But um, that makes it a two-dimensional phase space. The coordinate and the momentum uh, are the x and y axes. And then the z-axis, presumably coming out of the screen there, makes a three-dimensional figure, uh, is the Hamiltonian as a function of those two. Uh, quantities. I'd like to spend some time with this particular geometry. This is a Thales geometry that lets you uh, see uh, clearly uh, what variables are most efficient for describing the elliptic integrals that give you the um, very weird frequency de dependence on amplitude that this oscillator has. So this is not a harmonic oscillator except for very small uh, um, amplitudes. And uh, that is, uh, <clears throat> I think, pretty obvious just from looking at this thing. Here we have P uh, momentum 
of the angle theta squared, but here uh, we would have cosine of theta, that, that would be theta squared over 2 if I just took the first uh, 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 term of the Taylor series expansion of cosine of theta. So it's a harmonic oscillator only when I can, can ignore uh, theta to the fourth power and sixth power and eighth power uh, that would come out of a Taylor series uh, from that cosine. So uh, what if you can't ignore that, then what? Well, we've got two alternatives that we're going to talk about with regard to a uh, pendulum. And the first will, will simply be the anharmonic uh, potent uh, one. But then the remedy to that that um, um, the, uh, Mr. Huygens uh, discovered, um, and he only really figured the whole thing out about a year before he died. So he spent his whole life sort of with this in the back of his mind. Also realizing that it's such an important piece of physics to get the timing right, be able to uh, time astronomical events uh, precisely. So uh, it, it is a major, that was his major problem. But this is a really smart guy. Um, he really invented calculus just sort of in his spare time. And uh, he didn't, um, challenge Newton. He was very somewhat timid. And he was, of course, much younger. Newton was a big guy in the Royal Society, and, and um, Huygens was uh, just trying to knock on the door of the Royal Society to get in. And uh, he, he did a, a much more elegant job of developing calculus just on his own. So that's just a bit of, of what he is. The other thing that he's famously already talked about is the Huygens contact transformation that describes wave motion in a geometrical way. And we're going to go into that again to, uh, to do it as well. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead uh, with a little bit of this. I've already pointed out, I think, that this is another way to think about Hamilton equations. They've got this anti-symmetry uh, structure. They've got a cross product in there. Uh, the motion, uh, that is the uh, time uh, derivative, and let me use the center screen here, we'll get these things all synced up here. Um, that bottom line there, this q dot p dot equal, um, well it's not just the partial with respect to p and the partial with respect to q, that would be a gradient of h, but we've got a minus sign in there. This is the uh, z unit vector, the unit vector along the vertical direction there, cross the gradient. So the idea is if you're on a, uh, um, one of these trajectories going around, okay, and the, the trajectory, like a phase space, has to be, as I pointed out, left-handed, uh, the Hamiltonian uh, up. <coughs> the, uh, um, the idea is that at any point on that phase curve, uh, you're going, your speed is going to be determined by the gradient, but it won't be like uh, falling down a hill. You're going to stay on that curve, but the gradient, this perpendicular to that, uh, is what's giving your speed. So that's a sort of a funny way to look at this, the very simplest but not trivial uh, Hamilton uh, equation of motion uh, of a pendulum, an anharmonic oscillator. So I, I point this out. This is EH cross the gradient with a minus sign, so we get the left-handed motion. Okay. So basically the H axis, uh, H axis cross with a fall line. You're not going to go down the fall line according to the gradient. You're going to stay perpendicular to it. If you uh, know about, if you, how many people here have skied on a snow? Thing, just out of curiosity, uh, not too many uh, skiers here. Anyway, one of the things that you do when you're on a steep slope is try to get off the slope, and uh, you you go along, uh, per, you know, perpendicular to the fall line, but the you know slightest down or up, and you start to speed up, right? And uh, you know, it turns into disaster. Some trees on the other side, but anyway. Um, 
that's basically what we're talking about here uh, when we talk about the cross product with a gradient. That's determining your phase space motion, and that's Hamilton's equation written in a fun kind of way. Okay, um, let's see if there's anything else I can say about that. I think that's about it. So this is a sort of phase space curve, and of course it doesn't just contain the valley. As soon as you get above what's called a subparatrix, a separating curve, that red line there, as soon as you're outside of that, then the pendulum is having velocity as it passes the uh, uh, theta equal pi. The unstable balancing point of this thing is right there, right at the uh, intersection of the separatrix curves, separatrices. Okay, so get used to the name separatrix. It's going to show up in other things that we do. Um, that uh, has a flow this way on this side here that matches the flow right there, then uh, the phase flow coming uh, back here. Uh, that's continued down in this side. So the, the, eventually uh, you get so far up from this that the valleys don't matter anymore and you just get linear rotation motion, linear description of rotational motion. So if you get a pendulum that's really going fast, the gravity isn't affecting that thing very much. That's true classically and quantum mechanically, and that's an interesting um, uh, thing to, to think about uh, with respect to this, this particular uh, archetype of uh, oscillator that's not harmonic. Okay, uh, what's next here? The uh, elliptic function. So this is the dull part of this lecture, the, the algebra, but the elliptic functions are really something that needs more treatment. We're not going to do it here, uh, but uh, we will uh, hopefully get to uh, some uh, discussions of that. If any of you know Brad Clay, he's, that's his deal. Uh, he, he's really uh, noticed some interesting things that mathematicians have done uh, with elliptic functions that make some sense out of them. Uh, uh, um, we're just going to define them uh, for today. So. Uh, here we have uh, just what we know as a Hamiltonian, a Hamiltonian that's constant. That's what's making those level curves in the picture of the of valley and saddle point and all of that. The um, main thing uh, here is to be able to just write the equation uh, directly. But then, uh, since this is constant, I can integrate uh, that and give a uh, time as a function of coordinate. Now, of course, what you'd really like to have is a coordinate as a function of time, so you're used to doing that with harmonic oscillators. Uh, the elliptic function is the uh, solution to doing it here. So um, that is what we need to look at. So we're looking at an integral. It's kind of weird. Um, this is, as I said, this is an example of a quadrature uh, integral, an integral that that is being taken uh, over a quarter of the oscillator, um, re the, the quarter of its total trajectory. And um, this is uh, this, the, 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 this is an integral over angle and this is an integral over time. So we're looking for travel time uh, just uh, from zero to a particular uh, amplitude, a particular value. And that value would be, if we were talking about a loop like this, would be uh, a quarter of the way okay, uh, through an oscillator, uh, a, 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 t a total period tau. So um, the idea is to make that uh, integral uh, something that uh, we can deal with. And that's where the geometry comes in, the uh, geometry of energy. Um, this is a Thales geometry uh, construction, and it's a little rectangle in here uh, with a 90 degree uh, angle that goes with any point on the circle that subtends the total diameter. And uh, this is a half of the, half of the angle uh, of this. So, nice way to, to display the half angle, and that's the um, 
uh, transformation that we're going to do here, to use a half angle coordinate uh, to make a, a doable integral, make this integral uh, something that is worth talking about and tabulating and all that sort of things. So, um, writing this thing in terms of the epsilon angles uh, is uh, the key to it. So you end up with something like this, and that can be rewritten uh, just as a 1 minus k squared sine squared of epsilon. So that's, the, that's an, an elliptic integral right there. That's the, you know, it's called the elliptic integral of the first kind. There's a whole bunch of others that you can define for other purposes, but this is what we need for, <coughs> for the pendulum. So, um, normally we wouldn't include something like this in a review, but I think it's important to see uh, that it's there, and also make a connection of this with the case that this were suddenly to become a harmonic oscillator. If I were to do that, if I were to get this thing just to be uh, epsilon squared, that's just what it is for very small epsilons, uh, then I have the integral that gives the arc sine. So I have this time here uh, coming out to be uh, an arc sine of the, um, well, it's an arc sine of the epsilon uh, that you end up with. Um, <coughs> and uh, that, uh, you know, for very low amplitudes where the sine of epsilon is epsilon, that reduces to uh, this, that reduces to a quarter of the two pi. Uh, a period. So that uh, is just to let you see a connection between um, what we would call an analytic solution using the signs and cosines using trigonometry. At this point you realize that for me to do this, and I'm talking about doing it in the uh, 1600s or the 1700s, um, you have table of signs, right? Otherwise, what good is this thing? So somebody had to go through there and for each value make the numbers, right? Here, we're a bunch of lazy bunch. We just go on the sign button, right? Well, for, well is it, the most calculators don't have an elliptic function button. Not, I finally found one that did. It had actually all three kinds of elliptic functions. Like you literally push a button and you get the elliptic function. Uh, you had to put in a couple of variables in order to work because that's what most of the functions are defined that way. But um, the AM function uh, is, uh, this is the AM inverse function and that's the, the amplitude uh, function it's called. Um, the, the, that uh, is, um, let's see if I've got everything I need to have here. Anyway, that reduces to the sine. That, that particular function reduces to the sign. So, um, we can get it on this one down here as well. Okay, um, I don't think there's much else I need to say, except it's worthwhile one more time uh, just looking uh, at carefully at uh, what that uh, AM function uh, is um, with a simulation. And, um, I'm going to try to do it on this machine. I may come back. This one works actually a little better. But uh, let's go ahead and um, that's what we're going to be getting. Uh, <clears throat> I'll put that up here just as a reference in case this one doesn't work. Uh, you see what we talked about actually last time. Um, and we'll do this one too. That's what, that's what I want to do. I want to show Huygens. Uh, a pendulum. In any case, I start this one out with an amplitude that's pretty close uh, to uh, the top, that is pretty close to the top of the saddle point in that uh, weird surface that goes with uh, this one, and I might as well make use of the other projector here and get that picture up there, realizing uh, what you're doing uh, uh, as you oscillate through this, uh, this system, as you, I can't use the blue, I better use the green to point out here. And uh, 
these things are, so there we go. Uh, you, when you get to the saddle point, if you get right exactly on the saddle point, that would mean you have this thing balanced just perfectly. And I mean really perfectly, and, for, and quantum mechanics doesn't exist so that it can really be perfect. You sit there forever. But boy, it's really hard to balance this thing. And I can get within a, 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 fi a pixel of the top here, okay? Uh, instead of stopping uh, where it does, I'll, I'll stop a little closer, okay? Now we're starting to see the, the elliptic function forming there. And the other thing that's happening in this simulation is we're taking the Fourier transform up, okay? And that's another part of mechanics, is just to tra Fourier transform everything and solve those equations. Uh, we'll occasionally uh, resort to that uh, when we can. And uh, Rick Keller's way of doing quantum mechanics is to let the classical mechanics be Fourier transformed and then do the quantum mechanics automatically. That, that, this is all uh, really neat stuff. So I'm going to try to get within a pixel of that uh, thing there. Bing. Now I see 3.12 rating, so I'm not 3.14, but I'm still pretty well balanced for a long time. And then it repeats that, you see. When it comes around the other side, it also hangs up at exactly the, the, that period of time. So you're getting to see the AM function uh, pretty clearly there. And it's uh, kind of a square wave, right? If I could really you know, get within a fraction of a pixel there, I could make a big square and then whoop, another big one, whoop, and so forth, right? And then I could rescale that back to the point where it really started to look like a square wave, right? Anyway, the Fourier uh, uh, transform is starting to look like the Fourier series for a square, right? And what's that? Do you remember the coefficients for that? Okay, one-third minus a fifth, plus a seventh, okay? So we have a harmonic series of Fourier transforms alternating here, up, then down, then you can barely see it there, up, but it's one over, this one starts off one third, this one one fifth, this one one seventh, and there'd be a ninth if we waited a really long time here, okay? But, and of course it isn't. Uh, quite a square wave, so this is kind of a smoother Fourier uh, series than it would be if I could get the thing to really hang up there for a long time and then rescale it. Okay, I'll try one more time here to see if I can get it, you know, right within a pixel three point. I'm sort of messing with it a little bit. Yeah, here. You're also giving it a velocity. Yeah, that's not good. Let's let her go and see if. Yeah. Okay, now this, this, you see what happened. I'm just a little bit on the other side I took off, right? Let's try again. That's not good. I can I'll just, you know, you know re-punch re it here. One, two, that's what we had before. I was hoping to get a three, one, three, but I don't think I'm going to be, be getting that. That's just what we had before. Now, when you play with this thing, you can always use a bigger scale, you can use a finer screen, all kinds of tricks that you can do uh, to make a really uh, clearly square uh, um, elliptic function. Okay, now remember all of the other possibilities. If I started here, they look closer to being cosines and they're really fast. And as you get uh, down, uh, say do right, this one right here at 90 degrees, okay, eh, almost beginning to look maybe a little circular and so forth. The closer you get uh, to the bottom, the more circular you get and the closer you get to having an actual trigonometric function, in this case the cosine of the uh, uh, frequency of the pendulum in its limiting case of being, um, and you can see uh, that that one is, the zeros for the last two that I have done 
are commensurate for the first five or so oscillations. Okay. Now what Huygens wants to do is make this, this pendulum uh, work for all amplitudes available and have the same frequency. So that is the next topic. But any, any questions about this uh, before we go on to that one? Yeah. So the next stop here is a very strange looking uh, pendulum. Okay, and as I say, we have uh, reproduced in this room and you can play with it, but there's two um, pendulums actually uh, on this. I guess I'd better um, go and make use of this uh, screen here. So the laser seems to stop pointing here. Um, I will uh, come back on this to the, this guy and uh, put this uh, right here. So what, what there are over there, and as I say, there are two lead weights, fishing weights, stuck to threads, one of them uh, a little bit further out so that it doesn't wrap around a cycloid curve. Uh, it just makes a circle, and there's the circle that would follow, see that little faint line right there uh, underneath? That, that's the uh, ordinary pendulum. The ordinary pendulum uh, follows that track right there. Um, well, if the pin could hold it, it go all the way around, but we only stop the thing about there. The cycloid is limited in its um, angular amplitude, but not in the coordinate that we're dealing with. But anyway, this uh, dark curve here is a cycloid made by a point on a rolling circle whose curvature gets less and less and less and less until finally, and it's really hard to see that, but it, it kind of has a little kink on it so that it ends pointing straight up. That's something you might not have known about a cycloid, but it, it's, its curvature is going to infinity. Right there, okay? The last thing here, the string, the, the weight is going to be wrapping uh, on that uh, um, up, up point, uh, making a small circle and vanishing a small radius circle. So, uh, not much difference between these curves, and you can't see any di a difference all the way out here to about uh, 30 degrees or so uh, uh, for the ordinary pendulum. But boy, does it make a difference in the dynamics to do this. Okay. So, um, Let's go ahead on this screen and where I have control of the thing. Uh, we're now going to talk about uh, when he wasn't having his hair done, this is what he was doing. Okay. Um, we're going to make a, a simulation. And actually a simulation that I would, might as well start off with. I want to show you the geometry of the two cycloids. And that's what's interesting about this is when you wrap a string around a cycloid, and there, the cycloid with the pins in it are, is this curve, and we're wrapping a string around that, and there's a string unwrapping, and it's got to that point right, right there, okay, uh, for it to be actually on its cycloidic path. This is the same curve, except for translation, as this one. This one would just be another cycloid. This is the, um, when you uh, unwrap a string from a, a curve, you make another curve that's called the evolute. Anybody in calculus have studied evolutes in any of your courses? You, do you remember doing that? Uh, how many people just out of hands have seen evolute, involute? Well, Mons and the only one, I guess. Anybody else? Again, you're being cheated. <laughs> These, this should be in there. And the, uh, uh, the opposite, the opposite of that is looking with a particular curve for a locus of the center of curvature. That's the opposite of wrapping a string around and making this one. Uh, then I take this one and I look at each point. Uh, I draw a, radi a radius perpendicular there and the radius of curvature. And you can see what the deal is. If I have a string coming from here to here, the radius of curvature is the length of that string. 
anyway, this curve is called the involute of that one. And these are all things that people in mechanics knew so, so well. Uh, uh, people like Huygens and, and so forth. Um, and it's, uh, you know, what were you talking about? About things like that. So, uh, what's cool about this is that uh, when this is making, there's a, a pair of circles that roll. Uh, this circle rolls on this ceiling right here, and this circle here rolls on this ceiling, and the two of them together make both cycloids at once. Okay, that's what we'll see in the animation. Okay. And then we'll try for getting things like that. That's the curve. The curve. The curve. It looks like a bunch of straight lines. We're getting the sawtooth function instead of the square wave function uh, out of this. If we, if we're lucky, if we can get out to the extremes. So um, maybe what I'll do again is uh, put this on the um, screen here. And I'll leave the picture of the thing down there so you remember what that everything means. Um, let's just go ahead and see if this will go. Yes, there we go. Now this is a really jerky phase space when we're re we're close to the, the, the amplitude. Now let's uh, let's uh, start here uh, with smaller amplitudes. For example, let's just try a half. Okay. That's not too different from what we would have gotten if it was just a pendulum. You see, the thing is only wrapping uh, up to about four or five pixels up in here, so it's really just like hanging the ordinary pendulum. And what Huygens did first, and this was when he was really young, is he said, you know, the way we can improve pendulums is just put two circles you know, he just had a, you know, a little circle there and he had to figure out what's, uh, what the circle radius should be. And that's how he corrected the pendulums that um, were, have his, his signature. That's the Huygen correction. He didn't, and as I say, until he was uh, about to die, um, figure out that you needed a cycloid there. Okay, but it's essentially a circle. Uh, to start with. And so, um, as you go to higher amplitudes, uh, you need more of an arc. If I go out here to amplitude 1, okay, now I'm wrapping more. I'm, uh, I'm trying to speed this, this pendulum up by making it a string shorter. But doing it in a variable way. Right? When it's right in the center, I'm not trying to do anything to it, right? But when it gets out to the edge, it's going to be sped up by having to climb uh, the wraparound. Okay? And you can see, uh, the, unlike or, uh, the uh, ordinary pendulum, by the time I got to this amplitude, they were not crossing at the points down here, right? This one is. This one, in every amplitude I put, uh, on this thing uh, is going to have the, exactly the same frequency. And this will be a problem you solve later on. It's one of the many properties of the cycloid uh, that uh, they're kind of all ganging up on you on this particular uh, device that uh, uh, Mr. Huygens uh, came up with. Okay, now we're getting to the point where it's jerky, really jerky. And I'm going to try to start it right on the very end here. It's a little risky because I, you know, now I'm really at the mercy of what a pixel I can do to me. I can not be nervous and catch it. Oh, that's not going to work. That's just going to be another one of the curves I got. What I might try doing, I've forgotten how this uh, works the best. I might try going out here just a little bit on the edge here and see if I can get it to go. Bam. There we go.
So with this model here, this is showing you that if you had some way to make a pendulum out of a tin can that was magnetized so that it would roll without friction on a ceiling, the velocity of the tin can <laughs> rolling is constant. Then all of a sudden it reverses. Bang! 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 Net wild. So th this is an extreme case of an oscillator phase space. And it's not a harmonic oscillator, but it does have the property of a harmonic oscillator of being independent of the amplitude as long as I'm inside the cycloid. Okay, I'm, I'm limited by whatever geometry this thing has. But all of the amplitudes have the same frequency inside that domain. Okay. Okay, that's, uh, you know, the, it's this kind of stuff that makes classical mechanics fun. Just knowing the history of it is fun. It's really a, a beautiful uh, thing. And what would be the quantum mechanical equivalent of this? That's not an easy thing to think of. Molecular chains and all sorts of things. Um, that's for another day. Okay. Now, uh, what kind of Fourier transform are we getting? We're getting the Fourier transform coefficients here pretty much of a sawtooth. Do you remember how that goes? It goes as an integer squared in the denominator. You got one third squared, one fifth squared. Well, by one fifth squared, I can't see it, right? And I've been running this thing for a while. You let it run all day, and you'll start to see the Fourier components uh, pop up there. But it's one over an integer squared, so I really only have this one. You just barely see a little bit of a dimple in the other. One. Well, more analysis of this to come later, but I thought you ought to see it right off the bat. Uh, while we're talking about things that Huygens did. And um, there's a whole heck of a lot more things that uh, we need to get. Now, um, I guess it's time for uh, us to do just a little bit of the Caturini. So if there are enough questions about this, I will uh, bring this one to a halt. And uh, that is that. Let's get out here in the lecture and go forth. And we've had this homework problem already, right? This is where we look at where the bottom of a parabola that represents the result of shifting the origin. That is, we originally had an oscillator that sat here. And we decided to add an electric field, okay, a big electric field, so that it didn't just move, you know, a little bit this way, a little bit that way. This one was enough to take the whole parabola and bring it down, and in fact follow a path. The bottom of the parabola follows a path that is just the same as this curve turns upside down. I think most of you got that problem, but now we're going to look at it, and we're going to. Uh, do a simulation where we play with the uh, amplitude, that is, we'll, uh, the, uh, the amount of the electric field, but also we'll play with the frequency of the parabola. Make the parabola have a high frequency, or make it a fat thing that doesn't have a very high frequency, uh, and, and, and play with the amplitude for that one. So uh, let's see if I can get that uh, going. Um, what I guess I'd better do is maybe use that particular uh, screen. So this is the simulation that we'll see, uh, uh, presumably, if I uh, go ahead and turn this up. There we go. Okay, so the deal here is that I can be able, I can change the electric field, uh, QE, QE uh, here, and I've got to fix it so that I'm not changing the uh, spring constant too much, uh, but I can certainly do that. See if I'm a little worried about 
what the thing is. There, there we go. So there's a, there's a starting point right there. Uh, I can make the spring stronger by going here. And the idea, you see, is uh, to catch uh, this thing. Uh, in the, the face space, think of it as a, as a hurricane. Uh, and there's the eye of the hurricane right there. If I want to uh, uh, catch that thing, uh, the idea would be to uh, put the put this um, uh, object. And this, this is really quite kind of hard to do. Uh, but what I would like to do is go over there and try to catch the thing near the eye missile. I'm just making it possibly about the same amount around a new point. But maybe if I come in, whoop, I, I went the wrong way. When I come in and try to get it, there I go. Okay. I caught it, now it's in a very uh, a lower amplitude. So that's an example of de-resonance. What normally happens with it, when you play with this thing is, um, and let's just go and start, what, one of the things you can do here is just reset the thing so it's right in the center, but I'll let it oscillate a little bit there. I've got it so it's, it's calmed down. But what I can do is go like this, swing the thing over there, and then go on the other side, swing it over here. Well, you can see what's happening. I'm, I'm going to be out of control. At that time, I managed to, to reduce the amplitude by going uh, at just the, thing, just the uh, right motion. Okay. So when I get over here and try to get the thing in the eye, I got it stuck oscillating off the... Uh, origin and with not much amplitude. So th this is, I, I hold this up to you as something that could be engineered, should be engineered for anything that involves uh, controlling an oscillator. Now the other way to control it is to go this way. This is parametric amplification and we're going to study that uh, later on. That's a simulation called Jerk It, uh, which uh, we'll make a big deal about uh, le later on. But um, this is just the beginning of thinking about using phase space as a way to capture something or use it very uh, effectively and easily to amplify uh, the oscillations. Okay. All right. So that's the, the end of our discussion today of the classical applications. Uh, um, now what I want to do is, is go into the behind the scenes. The deep state of physics is quantum mechanics. Okay, and that uh, uh, comes next year. So let me um, make sure I pause this thing before I uh, get out of there and uh, go on here uh, to a weird derivation of Lagrange's equations. So, uh, what does that mean? I'm going to bring this one out to space. What that means is I want to discuss variational calculus. Uh, now this is really something that's in Unit 7 of this particular course. I've, I've um, pushed that kind of discussion to the very end and then realized that it's got to be in the review too. So here we go. Um, in just a couple of lines here, I am going to derive and derive in quotes because it's crazy way to do it. Got to explain that craziness. But as I say, uh, this derivation, derivation quotes, is very short. And it's also something that you, you, you should um, probably know about from uh, a good calculus course. And that's the, the calculus of variations that would be in what, Cal 3 now? I don't know. Is it, how, how many of you, you didn't see it in Cal 3? Um, again, <laughs> being cheated. <laughs> it should be. I mean, calculus variation may be often another uh, course entirely. But the deal here is uh, that I have this 
Lagrangian function of coordinate uh, and uh, velocity, queer coordinate, queer velocity, but whatever, could be x's and uh, just ordinary variables. Um, the idea is that this thing, which would be uh, called our action, um, th this thing, I'm going to try to find extreme values for that. I'm going to minimize this thing um, by adjusting every point, and this would be done uh, digitally by, say, having 20 points here, and I'm able to jockey any one of them. They're independent. I can make this one up, and that one down, and this one up, and so forth. Or I could just have a continuous uh, variation. That's what the uh, makers of this calculus of variation had in mind. The idea that uh, some function, delta q, so this is a function uh, that varies continuously from this point to that point in the independent variable. And so I'm trying to figure out how could I uh, make this particular integral come out to some extreme value, either a minimum or a maximum, uh, for some curve in here. Maybe the curve that does that is up here someplace. I'm going to try to find it. I'm going to try to locate uh, a, a particular uh, curve out of all the possible curves that would connect, uh, say, uh, this particular something at this particular time and some other thing. I'm not going to uh, move those two uh, values right there, and I'm not going to move these these times. But I'm going to play with everything in between. So. The demand to not vary at the boundaries is this form, and that's key to this derivation. But beyond that, it's just a matter of doing an expansion, and just a first order expansion will imagine that these things are actually a few pixels uh, uh, that we're working with uh, to, on top of some curve that we already have defined, uh, hopefully close to the result, uh, which is the extremum. So uh, I have an integral. Uh, written out here uh, 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 by varying this thing, by not just varying the actual uh, position that this thing has, but I also uh, vary the slope of the thing, the, the, the velocity. I'm going to vary the, the velocity uh, as well. These are independent.